Hello everybody, we're going to be going over congenital heart diseases. Now, we're going to be focusing specifically on atrial septal defect. Hmm, let's break that word into two. We're looking at the atrium, which has a septum because you have two atriums, right? We have the one on the right and we have one on the left. Oh, rocket science. And don't forget we have two ventricles too. So we have four rooms inside the house, like a four bedroom apartment. That is the heart. Now, every bedroom has a wall. That's good. You don't want to know, you don't want the, what they're doing in this side of the room to, the guy on this side of the room to find what this other person in this side of the room to, to know what they're doing, right? So they have a septum. It's an atrial septum, right? It's a septum between the right atrium and the left atrium, right? And a septum between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Genius, look at that. However, occasionally there might be a hole in between either the right atrium or there could be a hole between the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So this wall is called the septum. That's what separates both ventricles and the atrium. Now in this case, we're only focusing at the top. We're only going to focus on the atrial septal defect. When you're born with a defect, congenital, right? When you're born with it, it's not your fault, right? You didn't cause it. We call this atrial septal defect, called ASD. Now there's two types. There's an ostium primum and a an septum primum. Now let's break those words into two. Like, Osseum primum is basically a little bit up. So let's draw the septum. So I'm breaking out. This is the right atrium and this is the left atrium. And this is just the roof of the house, okay? Nice little apartment buildings. If it's really, really, really high up, the cardiologist named it a fancy name. They call it the osteum primum. Prime. Primum, the osseum, right there, there's an os, there's a little hole at the top. Now, if this is the septal wall and it's a little bit on the lower side, right, on the lower side between the right atrium, right, and the left atrium, we call that septum primum. So they're both primum, the one that's closest to the septum, they call it septum primum. The one that's closest to the osseum at the top of the building, right? It's a little hole at the top of the wall. That's it. That's all you got to know. But what you need to understand is 80%, 80, 80% of all atrial septal defect, it's going to be osseum primum, osseum primum, 80% of ASD. But before we move forward, for you to understand congenital heart disease, you need to master the circulation around the heart, which is pretty easy, right? Blood normally will come from the head and will come from the lower side of the body. It's gonna come in through the inferior vena cava. Everything from the lower extremities. Now to the top of the head, it's gonna drop eventually in the superior vena cava, superior inferior. They're gonna come together, right? And dump blood into the right atrium. And the right atrium is gonna take that deoxygenated blood, right? This is not a lot of oxygen in it. It's gonna take it and dump into the right ventricle. Now the right ventricle is gonna take that blood, right? And squeeze the resistance and pump the blood through this blue not blue, it's just a fantasy because it's deoxygenated. It's going to go through the pulmonary arteries, which is now going to go into the lungs. The pulmonary artery is going to become the smaller pulmonary capillaries, like the pulmonary arterioles, which is eventually going to become pulmonary capillaries, which is now going to take oxygen from the, and take a nice deep breath, exchange with carbon dioxide. The oxygen is going to make the uh, red blood cells turn red again. Ooh, we're ready to pick it up. Now I'm going to take you through the pulmonary vein right up into the left atrium. So there's always oxygenated blood in the left atrium. The left atrium is now going to pump this nice oxygenated blood, blood right into the left ventricle, which is now going to be pumped out through the aorta. The aorta is now going to give the rest of our body oxygen. 
that he needs. It's very simple. Now, once you master that, you're not going to be able to confuse ASD with VSD and where things are going. But I got to mention that you need to know that the pressures from the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava coming into the right atrium is always a little bit on the low side. And the pressure is also lower a little bit in the right ventricle because the muscles are a little smaller here. You don't need a lot of force to pump blood. Like the blood pressure inside the right ventricle is like 25 over 10, right? Less than 25 over 10. So that you can put blood into the pulmonary arterial capillary, uh, into the pulmonary arteries with the blood pressure sort of like 25 over 5, which is less than that. And in the left atrium, the blood pressure is less than 12. And the blood pressure in the left ventricle is, whoa, 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 120, right, over 80. The systolic blood pressure has to be at least 120 to overcome the pressure inside the aorta. So the pressure is very high in the left ventricle, a little bit not high as much in the left atrium. But look at the pressure even in the right atrium, it's even like around 5. The reason why this is important is because... 5 and 12, which number is greater? I think it's 12. So when we have an atrial septal defect, atrial septal defect, the pressure in the left atrium is going to force blood to go in what direction? It's probably going to go more from a left to a right shunt. That's why we call it a left to a right shunt, right? Because the pressure in the left atrium is greater than the pressure in the right atrium. Blood is going to oxygenated blood, right? Oxygenated blood is going to be shunted from the left atrium straight into the right atrium. Now that has no effect on the body at all. It has no effect on the body at all. But we have to now talk about what the sequelae of this will be over a long period of time. Now it's very important that you note that as the blood inside the left atrium is being pumped into the right atrium, what's going to happen to the cardiac, uh, the amount of blood inside the right atrium is going to go up, So, right? Because that makes sense. If there's more blood in the right atrium, there has to be more blood going into the what? Into the right ventricle, which means the right ventricle now has to do a lot of work to pump the right, uh, to pump the blood right into the pulmonary artery, which simply means is that you're going to have increased pulmonary systemic flow because now much blood is going from the right atrium to the right ventricle down to the pulmonary circulation, increase the amount of blood flow that's going through it. What do you think is going to happen over time as the left atrium is pumping blood into the right ventricle? Well, the right ventricle is going to be pissed off. It's going to start to dilate. The right ventricle it's going to also start to dilate because it can't really do all the work anymore. It's trying to work out and work out. It's like, this is too much work for me. I normally don't get this. And that pressure is going to be high because now you're pumping so much blood through the pulmonary circulation. Although this is very rare, these patients can develop pulmonary hypertension, a very rare condition in patients with ASD. But it's possible they can develop pulmonary hypertension, which means the blood pressure inside the pulmonary circulation is very high, which means the pressure that's been exerted between the vessel wall is severely high. But remember, this is very, very, very rare. Now, what is going to happen that's going to cause this sequelae is as this hole gets starts to get a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger, more blood is not going to be shunting into the right atrium, which is not going to worsen the condition. Let's talk about the clinical course of this patient. These patients are normally asymptomatic. And let's talk about why they're asymptomatic, right? Symptoms. They're normally asymptomatic. Why? Think about it. Oxygenated blood going into a deoxygenated chamber has no effect on the body because what will happen is this deoxygenated blood is going to mix with the oxygenated blood and be pumped back into the, into the pulmonary circulation, pick up oxygen again, come back into the left atrium, left ventricle, and you might get a couple of them out of the system. So the body doesn't feel it. The patient doesn't feel it. They can have this for at least 20 years. 20 years. 
walking around feeling fine. But by the time they start to reach 40 years old, right, start to reach 40 years old, they start to complain of exercise intolerance. They might like, oh, you know what, this is a perfect time, I haven't been working out for years, they start to go to the gym, and it's not like, man, they get out of breath, they can't really work out. And also they get shorter breath and exertion. So they get shorter breath, which is another fancy word, we use this near, right? On exertion, they get exercise intolerance. Now, why do, you, why do they get shorter breath? Why do they have exercise intolerance? Think about it. You're losing some of your cardiac output, which is supposed to come in, be coming out of your heart, into the right ventricle, right? Into the right atrium. So they're not pumping enough circulation. So now when their heart is working twice as hard, right? The heart is squeezing really fast. It's squeezing and blood is going this way rather than going that way and up. You're not getting enough blood into your circulation. You get out of breath <sighs> because you're almost becoming anemic just because you're not getting enough cardiac output out into the rest of the body. Now, you also have to realize this is usually mild. These patients can also have a normal lifespan over the period of life, but when they start to develop symptoms, usually they complain of exercise intolerance, you feel fatigued, and short of breath. When you look, you look at the patients, what are we gonna see on physical exam? We're gonna hear a very distinct murmur called it's a mid-systolic ejection murmur at the pulmonary area, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, due to increased pulmonary blood flow. So, mid-systolic ejection murmur plus a wide fixed split fixed split as to sound. Now how are they going to develop this? Think about it. Mid systolic ejection murmur. If you have a lot of blood inside your right ventricle and the blood is trying not to go out into the pulmonary artery, there's a lot of blood going out into the pulmonary artery. Now during systole, what happens? The pulmonary artery opens, the aortic valve also opens. But during that time, your right atrium and your right, uh, um, I'm sorry, your tricuspid and your mitral valve, they close. So you hear your S1, right? You hear S1 and you're happy. However, because there's a lot of blood that's going out into the pulmonary circulation, you're going to hear a fixed split. It's going to be like S1, S1, S1. Now, that's S1 and a fixed split S2. It's literally one, two. Because the blood inside the pulmonary circulation is higher, so you can hear the fixed split. It's always splitting the S2 sound, but remember, there's a physiologic split. There's a physiologic split when you tell somebody that's normal to take a deep breath in, when you listen to the pulmonary component right here in the second in the costal split on the left, you're going to be able to hear that split X2 sound like that. But that's always during inspiration, that's normal. But if you have a fit widened, fixed split S2, that is telling you the patient has a atrial septal defect because the blood is so high inside the pulmonary circulation and that's why they have that. And they also have, that's also the major cause of their mid-systolic ejection murmur. You might be able to hear a diastolic rumble. A diastolic rumble. Let's talk about that. A diastolic rumble in the patient because this usually are across the tricuspid. What happens as the blood trickles over into the right atrium, it flows and touches this tricuspid valve. You may be able to hear that diastolic, diastolic rumble right in the left lower sternal border in the tricuspid region and this is all just due to increased blood flow flowing down through that through that area 
of the tricuspid valve. So, but the key is, remember, wide fixed split S2, wide fixed split S2, wide fixed split S2 with a mid systolic ejection murmur, classic for atrial septal defect. How are we gonna make the diagnosis? Well, making the diagnosis is very easy because what we are going to use is called transesophageal echocardiogram, TEE. -E. We're gonna use a transesophageal echocardiogram. We're gonna put a scope down through your esophagus, look at the back of the left atrium because we're gonna see the back of the atrium, but the left and the right, and be able to see if you have a little hole in between your right atrium and the left atrium. We can order a chest x-ray, and chest x-ray will show us dilated pulmonary arteries, right? It's gonna be dilated because what will happen is, as there's so much blood flow, so, see so this is your heart, right? And you've got the pulmonary going that way, this way, this way, and that way. What we will see is they're gonna be, all this pulmonary artery is gonna be dilated because there's so much increased blood flow going into the pulmonary circulation, so you're gonna be able to see that on chest x-ray. If you order an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram on the patient, these patients are predisposed to atrial fibrillation because of the dilation over time of the right atrium and the right ventricle, most likely the right atrium, they're gonna start to develop atrial fibrillation. So you might see the irregular, irregular, no P waves on EKG. They might also have a right ventricular, a right bundle branch block, right? So you look at lead V1 and lead V2, and you see something like this. An R, S, R prime, right? You see R, an S wave, and an R prime on EKG. That's showing they have a right bundle branch block. We call that rabbit ears in uh, emergency medicine. So if you see that, or they have atrial fibrillations because they can be predisposed to this condition where you order an electrocardiogram. Now, what are the complications of this problem? If this lasts long enough and you didn't fix this problem, what are the patients going to develop over time? Well, we can easily reason this out. We've been mentioning one all day. The most important pulmonary hypertension. You don't want this patient to have pulmonary hypertension because the pressure in the pulmonary circulation is very high. Now blood is, the right ventricle is gonna try to squeeze again a higher pressure and it can and eventually it's gonna give up and you're gonna develop right ventricular failure. If you develop right ventricular failure, what will happen? Blood is not gonna start backing up because now the muscle can't contract anymore. It just relaxes. It's like basically congested heart failure on the right ventricle. Now you develop what? JVD, ascites, hepatomegaly, low extremity edema. This is a very, very serious problem. Also, these patients can develop Eisenmenger's disease. Eisenmenger's disease. Now, what is Eisenmenger's disease? This is a reversal of the ASD. We said the ASD is normally what? A left to a right shunt, right? From the left atrium, look at the red line, oxygenated bone to the right atrium. However, when it reverses, and how can you reverse this? Over time, dilation of the right atrium, dilation of the right ventricle, right? Increased pulmonary arterial pressure, right? Causing them to develop pulmonary hypertension. Now it can reverse because the pressure is so high, it pushes the blood back now to the right ventricle the deoxygenated blood can go back into the right atrium through the blue line and bam, these patients can develop a left to a right shunt. This is basically converting a left to a right to a right to a left. I meant to say, apologize, it becomes a right to a left and right to left means you have the deoxygenated blood now flowing into the left atrium. Now if deoxygenated is getting its way, deoxygenated blood is going into the left atrium, what do you think is gonna happen? The blood's not gonna mix with the oxygenated blood in the left ventricle. 
in the left atrium go on to the pulmonary circulation and the patient is going to be cyanotic right they're going to be blue because the blue well, i'm just using blue but the oxygen in the blood it's not going to be able to supply your tissues and the patient might have periorbital cyanosis you might see like, the lower extremities also turn blue also you got to be careful to make sure these patients don't have a reversal of their asd caused but and we call that eisenmenger's disease Eisen, you spell that correctly, it's Eisenmenger's, M-E-N-G-E-R, Eisenmenger's disease. Remember they're predisposed to also what? Atrial fibrillation, that is another complication of this disease due to dilation of the wall of the right atrium. It's now, let me give you a case. Assuming it was a 36 year old female, 36, right, where, you know, comes in with a sudden onset, sudden onset of weakness in her right arm and a right leg, sudden onset weakness, she couldn't move, she has no medical history, she has no surgical history, no allergies, she's not taking any meds, she's not on birth control pills, She's perfectly healthy. 36 year old girl develops a stroke. Sudden so is on the right arm and the right leg. When you listen to the heart, you heard a fixed split S2 sound. What do you think caused the stroke? The patient developed a stroke from a paradoxical emboli due to, oh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Well, but from an atrial fibrillation. But what we heard was irregular, irregular of, let's take that story back. She had an irregular, irregular heart rate. And there was no P waves, an EKG. And you notice she has atrial fibrillation. How did she develop a stroke? It was a paradoxical. So let's draw the, this is the right atrium, left atrium. She developed from dilation of, of the right atrium, right? She de developed a clot inside her right atrium, and because she has atrial septal defect during uh, systole, one of this clot broke off and bam, went into the left atrium. We jumped into the left ventricle, went out into the aorta and went into the a coronary arteries, right into the internal carotid arteries, which went into the middle cerebral arteries and eventually infarcted uh, us right side of our brain, which caused us to have weakness on the right arm and the right leg. That we call a paradoxical, paradoxical emboli, paradoxical emboli, which is basically a block clot that finds its way through the brain that passes through that hole inside the heart. That is a severe disease. All right, and that's probably due to atrial fibrillation also. But if you ever see that case, that's usually what causes it. You don't want this patient to develop a stroke, so how do we treat it? We surgically repair it, right? So the cardiologist is gonna go in there and put, uh, and close up the valve, uh, close up the opening so that there's no connection between the right atrium and the right uh, and the left atrium. All right, okay, that brings us to the end of atrial septal defect. Remember, these patients are usually asymptomatic, they don't develop symptoms until they are 40 years old. Understanding the circulation around the heart gives it a perfect way to be able to picture it. That's why I went through the whole notion so you can understand it a little bit better. All right. Remember, treatment is surgically repaired and the patient feels fine and they're going to be able to go home and have a good day. All right. Thank you very much for watching. Until I see you again, have a good day. Bye-bye.